Welcome, everyone, to the Justice League Dark Apocalypse War panel discussion here. We've got the greatest cast and crew you could ever imagine. Um, thanks for being with us. Thank you to Warner Brothers Home Entertainment and IGN for hosting this fantastic panel. Um, uh, the movie is produced by Warner Brothers Animation, DC, and Warner Brothers Home Entertainment. It is now available on digital, and I encourage you to watch it if you haven't already, once or twice or three times or whatever you've got time for. Uh, you can pick up your 4K or Blu-ray combo pack on May 19th. And without further ado, let's get into who's on the panel with us. So, we start with a, uh, a, one, a man who's written four of our films in this uh, incredible uh, nine-year, 15 film arc. Uh, he wrote four of them, including Justice League Dark. Say hi to Ernie Altbacher. Hello. Imagine applause. There's 4,000 people in the audience. Oh, thank you. Live yeah. audience. There's millions at home watching. This is great. Um, oh, I'm getting a snap from Jerry. Nice. Um, a prolific director of his own right. Uh, his first time directing a DC Universe movie. Uh, though we boarded on three different DCUs in the past, say hello to Matt Peters. Hello. Thank you. <laughs> so weird doing it without a crowd live. Um, first time DCU director, although she's boarded 16, storyboarded 16 different DCU movies, including eight in this story arc. Um, welcome Christina Soda, co-director. The maestro of this incredible, epic run of films. Our executive producer, James Tucker. <laughs> Y'all should be clapping at home, too, I hope. Uh, you know him from Covert Affairs and Insatiable. He is our Flash six times in this series. Say hi to Christopher Gorham. <laughs> You know him from so many different series. Terra Nova, amongst others. Most recently, The Man in the High Castle. Eleventh time he's showing up as Batman in Justice League Dark Apocalypse War. Jason O'Mara. Jason. You can tell he's Batman by his shirt. Dressing appropriately is a good thing. Uh, you might remember him from a little film called Stand By Me. Or Cush in... Jerry Maguire, seventh time he's Superman. Jerry O'Connell, show the shirt. Strong Island, and Constantine, always Constantine from Legends of Tomorrow, from the show Constantine. His third time as the Hellblazers himself, including Constantine, City of Demons. Matt Ryan. All right, that was fun, and the audience was deafening. I love that. Hey, this was a pretty impressive run of films. We've been uh, making these for nine years. When I say we, I mean James. Um, uh, Fifteen films in this arc. Seven different directors across this line. Ten different writers. 172 different actors have been in these films. Uh, many recurring um, two voice casting, uh, two voice directors, and it was starting with Andrea Romano for five films, and then ten films with Wes Gleason. Um, Apocalypse, War, uh, Apocalypse War is the only film where we did not have one single actor that came new to the series. So, interesting. And everybody came back and was happy. Um, James, you're the only one who's been here throughout, from Flashpoint Paradox to Apocalypse War. How did you go about imagining and planning an arc of this scope and scale? <laughs> well, uh, one movie at a time, basically. Uh, you know, we got the gig to uh, just do some movies. And after Flashpoint, we were told, oh, now make a continuity. Um, which kind of replicated what they were doing in the comics. But we didn't know that going into Flashpoint. We just thought it was a one and done. Um, but it went over really well, the movie did, and, um, you know, uh, the execs decided they wanted, uh, more. And so we had to kind of scramble and start, you know, figuring out what we wanted to do, and we could only do as much 
as we knew they were going to greenlit, greenlight rather, um, and they only greenlight maybe a year in advance. So it was kind of like, okay, we'll do this movie, and then we'll, you know, basically remember what happened in that movie, so that the next movie we could continue the threads. And um, pretty much that was my job. Um, Alan Burnett, who recently retired, um, he had a lot on his plate, and continuity was not his big concern. So he just was like, okay, you can, you remember that stuff. And so, uh, yeah, so we kind of built it as we went along. I knew, I knew certain high points I wanted to hit um, as we went along. Um, but then surprises happened. Things happened that I, I wasn't anticipating. And then we, it was like, okay, let's just use that. And so um, it's kind of happened piecemeal. It was very uh, kind of built as we went along. Improvised. Improvisation. And yet it all looks seamless. Yeah, I should really not be admitting all of this. I should have, you know, admit, said, oh, we all knew where we were going and all this and plotted it out and had grids and all that stuff and spreadsheets and nah. I've been pouting your genius of all of that. and Thanks for blowing that. Uh, let's, uh, why don't we take a moment and um, see how this film begins. So if we could please run that clip, we have to attack. Remember. Remember what? That I love you. Didn't think that was in doubt, Z. I just wanted to say it before. Before nothing. The League will sort this out and we'll be having pints by sundown. Or whatever that is round here. I'm glad you joined the League. I'm here for you, love. Just don't ask me to wear a cape. All Justice League members, report to the hangar now. Way to cock block, Batsy. Well, time to go. Thank you for responding so quickly. Some of you already know what this is about, but I wanted to get the new members up to speed. This is Apocalypse, homeworld of Darkseid, a power-mad despot who has orchestrated two attempted invasions of Earth, the first of which resulted in the formation of the Justice League. The second one, an attack from within our ranks by Cyborg Superman and his Cyber Force. <sighs> Raven, what's wrong? It's nothing. This image was taken by surveillance 10 hours ago on the edge of the solar system. Apocalypse phased into our dimension and released stealth drones, then phased out again. This can only be looked at as a prelude to war. Darkseid aims to conquer the Earth and crush it under his heel. Regular Churchill he is. Shh. Look, I know the guy's a genocidal maniac, but are we sure those are his immediate plans or something he'll try in like a thousand years? These are images from worlds that Darkseid has conquered. Our intel shows that he's now sent his elite guard and the Furies to act as an occupying force to thwart any resistance. I want to make this perfectly clear. We are facing an existential threat to the planet. We can't wait for Darkseid to make the first move. That could mean the end of us. We have to attack. The evolution of the story, I mean, that's where we start. Why did we start here? What was the uh, what was the thought process behind going with that, James? Uh, directors, uh, Ernie? Well, we're connecting to the last place we left Constantine. Um, and Zatanna, which was 
she was wanting him to join the league and, and he was considering it, but then he had ruled it out when we last saw them a couple of years ago on uh, the original Just League Dark movie. So we thought, and since this was a Just League Dark movie uh, to begin with, we would start back up with them. But because we knew we were going to have to broaden the story to encompass, you know, everyone, <laughs> since this was the wrap up, we started with them and then... That's that led into the big, you know, scene with all the other Just League members, and then we went from there. But that was the, you know, we were just basically connecting the dots, showing that their a relationship had furthered to where they were together, and he had joined the league. And it's also kind of like framed by Constantine and Zatanna's relationship. You know, this entire world epic thing. There's several frames and several relationships, but. That's kind of one that's very key since it is ostensibly a Justice League dark movie. Nine years on this. What's the degree of difficulty of continually raising the bar and especially for this kind of epic blockbuster, no hold bar, a post-apocalyptic epic? Well, apart from, I'd say, the original Justice League War and Flashpoint, this is probably the most grueling uh, big movie we've done in the lineup. I mean, we've done big movies, um, but usually I tried to, you know, we were hoping it would work out where we do one movie that was say a Justice League, but then we follow it up with the movie that maybe was a little smaller in, in scope. Um, the directors will tell you none of that ever happened. We were, they were all big, but um, you know, we'd follow up like a serious Batman movie with something a little lighter. Or at least, um, you know, or rather, I'll flip the script. We'll start, a Batman movie tends to have fewer characters. So we, if we follow, do a Justice League, we'd follow it up with a Batman that would then kind of be a little smaller. And then, you know, like Suicide Squad is a, it, it was a big, big-ish movie, but the story itself was kind of quiet and contained. There weren't a lot of huge action set pieces. So um, that's how we tried to manage to not kill ourselves through all of it. Um, it was a, you know, it was a task because you always want to better do better than the last one, no matter what the scale was of the previous story. You just want to make sure the stories are strong. There's character growth and development. Everyone gets juicy scenes and stuff. And so, uh, you know, that's always a concern. It's just always trying to up yourself and, uh, and, you know, make, make, make everything matter, especially in a continuity where you're building, you know, you're hopefully building towards something. It, you, you said there were surprises along the route. Was I mean, I'm assuming the way you just laid that out, Justice League Dark was one of those smaller, intimate films as an offshoot of the Justice League. Was it a surprise to you to come back around to Justice League Dark Apocalypse War to button the whole thing? Well, I once Just League Dark came out, there was a lot of buzz about it, you know, in other quarters, and, and I knew there was a plan to do it eventually. We just didn't know when that was going to roll around. And so um, I loved the first Just League Dark. It was just a hoot. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. Cause it was, as, and it was also dealing with occult issues. It was kind of a horror movie. There were some really, you know, horror, horror elements to it that we hadn't really touched on in other movies. And, and it was really funny. I mean, it had a lot of good jokes in it that um, I just thought it went. It played really well um, when we pre premiered it, and um, I just thought it really. It was a lot more fun to it than we get to have typically with a regular Justice League movie, um, and so I liked I liked that. And also, I think it was our first our our movie in the lineup. I think. I'm pretty sure. Well, it was our first official R where they said, okay, you can right. keep it as an R. <laughs> we had two more before that where we couldn't, we had to cut to uh, to make them not R's. But, uh, and and I, I don't think that, I don't think I would have gotten on to the thing unless it was, not a lot was expected from Justice League Dark. <laughs> All right. Like they were like, you know what? This is a smaller one. It's kind of weird characters. And, uh, sure. You know, Alan Burnett's like, ah, no, I, I, I think Ernie can, can do this one. He's new, but you know, I'll, I'll, I'll sit on him and make sure it comes out. Okay. And that, that's the only, 
I, I wouldn't have gotten that. You're just bugged or something? Did you? <laughs> there we go. Ernie Allbacker, master of the low expectations. What are you joking? It was great. It was fun. No, no, I love I love doing it, but I'm just saying I think that was the only way I was going to get in. They're, they weren't going to give me like a Justice League movie to start, you know. So you have to kind of prove yourself first. I mean, as the as the directors know, you know, same thing. Let's, uh, you know what, let's, uh, let's roll over and take a look at our three main post-apocalyptic protagonists, Constantine, Raven, and Superman, uh, along with maybe a, a little side of Etrigan and, and, uh, and of course, Paradooms. Uh, can we roll the clip reunion, please? John, it's me. Clark Kent. You knew me as Superman. Is you? I thought you'd snuffed it. Ah! Oh, bloody! Now you've done it. John, wait! We're not here to fight. It come to the wrong place then. Azeroth Metrion. Ah. Stop! Quit playing around, Boy Scout. Smash him! I can't! <laughs> Bloody useless, both of you. Fantasy Expos. <laughs> Little help would be nice. Everybody should understand, none of the actors in this film recorded together. I don't even know if Matt and Jerry have ever met in person, and yet everything meshes together so perfectly. Have you two ever even met? Oh, we haven't, right? I guess just through like Zoom meetings and social media. This is the new meeting. Yeah, I, I, met, I met Jason a couple of times and we did the uh, Justice League Dark uh, premiere in Los Angeles. But it's always strange, isn't it, when you're doing uh, voiceover work and uh, uh, with these things and there's all these actors and then, you know, you don't actually interact with them. But uh, it's great how it turns out on the screen in the end. You, you, you're sharing, what are you sharing? The screen, the mic, the audio track? I don't know how you'd say that. Uh, but it is cool to be in their company because there's, some, there's been some amazing actors. Shout out to Wes Gleason, who's our voice director, who really gives us, um, you know, he always feeds me Matt or Jason's, uh, you know, or Rosario's lines and um, helps me get to uh, emotionally where I have to be. He's really, really helpful. How did you guys settle on these three to be the linchpins for this uh, film? Well, you know, uh, I went, I went in, and uh, and James obviously he sees the twenty thousand foot view. He knows what has happened in all the other movies, well, you know, and um, and he's like, here's some points we have to we have to hit, but otherwise it's kind of like a free reign. And I got to give the shout out to the kind of the. The writing overseers were Alan Burnett, who's now retired, but he was great, and and Jim Creek, um, and uh, and so, you know, they they kind of said, here's some other things that we want to get in, uh, but we want it to be world reaching, and it, it was just kind of a giant project. I, I also have to mention that uh, there was another writer on this, very talented. Margaret Scott. Yay for Margaret. Um, what was uh, was he using two of those three main protagonists to do with magic? I mean, was ma how how important was it to have magic in a super powered universe? 
Well, this was a meshing of Justice League Dark, which, which is mainly an occult kind of story, an occult universe, trying to merge it with a sci-fi kind of world, which is Justice League. And so I knew that both sides had to be equally balanced as far as the story. I couldn't just make it totally Justice League Dark, although there are lots of scary places in it. So it was a, it was a kind of a weird balancing act of trying to keep it super heroic in places. Um, but we definitely play into the... I mean, in this one, in other movies, Dark reflected occult or magic or something. In this instance, I think Dark represents the tone of what's happening, um, the, the psyche of the characters at, at when we meet them again in this movie. Um, it is a dark, um, it's a dark world now. So um, balancing both sides of it, the magic and the super, super heroics, the sci-fi, um, it kind of meshed better than I thought it would actually. Um, and it was great having those sides kind of blend together. So it, it always kept you guessing what was going to happen. You know, there'd be a cool action bit and then there'd be some good bit of magic or, you know, it was just kind of volleying the ball back and forth uh, between both sides of the story, the, the dark and the, the sci-fi and the superhero. Uh, Christina and Matt Peters, you were co-directors on this. How did you divide to conquer on this one? Uh, we basically picked which characters we wanted to pay attention to. Uh, Matt is a huge Superman fan, so it was no given he would kind of take point on that. And I had boarded several Raven scenes in the first Justice League vs. Teen Titans movie, so I figured, oh, I remembered what happened with that, I'll take that. And then we split up the rest. Yeah, and Soda and I also work together just to, just as friends and you know coworkers. So we've been on films together, and and we just know each other socially. So it was it was easy, you know. It was like we're getting an opportunity to you know work with with a friend, and so we just sat down and just like she said, we just decided. I don't even think we had to argue. It was like a minute we just <laughs> we just said it was like I, I I wanted to do Superman and I know she wanted to do Raven. It was like the script just divided almost equally. <laughs> And there were a couple of scenes that overlapped a little bit. So we would uh, just double check with the other when, like if there was a scene that had a little bit of Raven and Damien together that was in Matt's scene, I might chime in and be like, oh, make sure you do this. Uh, just so we could keep track of every character's arc. Yeah, it was actually really nice to have because it was having another person that could actually um, you know, give me a lot more feedback on something that was, you know, she knows that character so much better than I do. So it was like, it was uh, almost like a, like a psych evaluation that I could like, you know, go to for information and, and, and source from to make, you know, seem work better. I was grateful for it. It was a good soundboard sort of thing too. It's like, Hey, what do you think if we tried this? And we could spitball with each other before we put pen to paper. Jason and Chris uh, started on this series. They started recording in November of 2012 on Justice League War. Jerry joined in, in uh, for the 2015 movie Throne of Atlantis, and Matt came in for Justice League Dark. How did, these, how did approaching these characters for this film differ from all of your experiences before? Who wants to start? Matt, you start. Um, uh, well, it, what's great, what's interesting is playing Constantine. Obviously, I did him on the live action, uh, played him on the live action show Constantine, and then Arrow and Legends and all the other renditions. But you know, playing him—it's a funny thing, isn't it? Without without the costume, without the trench coat in the booth was a was an interesting thing. Actually, at, at one point, I thought about bringing the jacket into the booth because there's something about the physicality of that jacket that just changes my physicality anyway. But I, I didn't, I didn't end up doing that. But um, but it's been great to kind of transpose the character from from the TV screen into uh, all of these all of these movies, and it's 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 been great to flesh John out in these worlds, which we don't get to do on the live action stuff. 
unlike Matt, I wear full Superman outfit when I record. Everyone knows that. Um, full head to toe, cape, boots, uh, my hair, I shave. It's a whole thing. Everyone knows that. Um, no, I have to say, um, everyone, the, the whole team, Justice League team, Warner Brothers animation team, they always keep it fresh every movie. They give us so many things to play with. And it's, um, I'm, I'm really grateful to everyone on the Warner Brothers animation team. They really give us, they give us stuff to do, you know? I, I mean, in, in my case, I'm not just playing Superman and then playing Clark. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm playing, uh, you know, a bad boyfriend to Lois. I'm playing, um, a, uh, an orphan uh, from Krypton. They, they just give me, um, so many things to play with. So it's really, uh, it's, it's not just us, the actors, it's what we're given. It's the material that we're given. If you, if you really want to out there, fans should Google search Jerry O'Connell and, um, I think it was reign of the Superman premiere or death of Superman premiere last year. And check out the suit he wore and had to starve himself for three weeks to fit into. Chris, how'd this differ for you? Well, usually when I come in to do these movies, it's just a few quippy lines and some punching sounds. or And, and then I get to go home. And this time, <laughs> this time I came in and it was very dramatic. Um, and also got to do the sound of... Uh, um, I, I also... Um, played uh, the guard who gets his head bitten off by the shark guy. Um, so that was also exciting. I think that was my kid's favorite role that I played in this film. We watched that two or three times. They were like, ooh, again, again, again. Jason? Uh, like Jerry, I was, well, Jerry's done my joke, but I, I wanted to uh, uh, wear a cape and cowl for at least one of these recording sessions, but I never got around to it. I never, I never got it together. I just wanted to show up in the full, you know, uh, the full thing just once, but never did. What most people don't know is the movie that was rated R was actually rated R because Jerry uh, recorded in full frontal nudity. <laughs> He's famous for that. Yeah. Jerry without his shirt is almost as famous as Chris without his shirt. Um, Actually, but to be serious for a second, I, I felt like I, there was quite a bit of pressure on me starting out with like Justice League War and some of those earlier Batman movies, just because the role is so iconic. I felt like I needed to, you know, do it justice. But I felt like, you know, the character of Batman has evolved over the course of this of this of this series of films, and uh, and you know we've got to know him as a father, um, for better or worse, uh, as a member of the Justice League, as a friend, um, and as his characters sort of evolved, I feel like my own performance has got a bit more relaxed and, and nuanced and stuff like that. So um, I suppose it was lovely in a way to show up to this film kind of feeling like I had everything I needed in terms of the character and in terms of my performance. What I didn't realize until I opened the script was that this this film for Batman takes a real turn. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I don't want to give away any spoilers, but um, it's not a regular Batman, you know, he comes in, he kicks ass, he goes back to the Batcave. It's not that kind of story. So uh, that was challenging in itself. Ernie. Um, you all right, Gary? Uh, Gary, have you got the yeah. virus? Just had to clear this here. Let me just take Gary, put a mask right. on. We're all catching. Uh, Ernie, usually, uh, you know, there's been this barking about Superman and keeping him relevant. And a lot of times people try and kill him off to make him, uh, give him a hitch. This time you guys came up with a way of not killing him off, but letting him fail without dying. How did that come about? And, um, and how did that correlate back with, uh, dark side and kind of having to defeat the undefeatable? Well, uh, you know, I have to give credit, to, uh, I believe Margaret and, uh, and yeah, Margaret and, and, Margaret. and Jim. She's a huge, yeah. uh, Superman fan. 
Yeah, she's a she's a Superman nerd, and she thought up that depowering idea. So that was in there when I kind of took the baton and uh, and started on it. And then the uh, the final part of the plan um, with Cyborg, I just thought it was done so smartly, and I, I forget how that. Uh, fell together that might have also you know uh the seeds of it were were in there but there were just so many so many pieces and endings and beginnings that it was it was a really cool thing to to work with i mean going back to your question sorry uh a depowered for a great reason superman was a, a fun character to write because you know he's not he's not the man of steel you know and um a lot it's a little bit of a different mindset i think well it's it was there kind of to say that superman is superman regardless of his powers it's it's about who he is as a person is his ideals his um his moral compass and all that and even without his powers he's still superman he still wants to do the right thing and he, in this case, he wants to make right something he, you know, screwed up. So, I mean, that's what makes him Superman, not his heat vision and his, you know, flying and freeze breath. Yeah, I like freeze breath. Okay. <laughs> um, Why? Why? Um, just for the record, though, it is the Flash that ends up having to fix everything. <laughs> it's true. Well, originally, I, I thought this would be a, a, a bigger, because it was kind of sh a, a bookend on Flashpoint, but um, but I think Flash's point, I think that might have been kind of predictable if we had made it all about Flash, so I think the key stuff he gets to do in it, it's all about him anyway, in, you know, because he, he caused everything that happens. So, or it has happened. Um, but yeah, initially I thought it would be a bigger Flash uh, showcase, but but what you got was choice. Well, when you, when we had started talking, you were like, I, I really need Constantine to be a bigger part of this. Yeah, it you wasn't know? quite it, popping. It wasn't it quite being, a Justice League Dark movie. Yeah, Justice League Dark. So, so actually, even though the F Flash does it, it's Constantine's idea, and there was some stuff that had to go. I mean, it's still ninety minutes long. It's it's, it's amazing. Yeah, it's our longest it's movie in the animated. Line. All of this, you know, but there was other reasons yeah, where he was kind of getting pushing the, the Flash into doing story. it. You know, what was that, Chris? No, I said it, I'm surprised that it was ninety minutes. Actually, from watching it, it goes it goes by really fast. It's a really good story. Yeah, it didn't feel like that. Too. That's a that's a lot of characters, a lot of a lot of characters, locales, situations, subplots. It, it I mean, this is our biggest film to date, and period. I think we've had. I mean, we've had bigger. You know, we've had as big uh, with action and stuff in movies, but I think plot wise. The depth of the story, the the stakes that are at play, you know, I think yeah, definitely there's a a gravitas to this movie that a lot of the other ones we just hadn't gotten to, except maybe Death of Superman. I remember talking, <clears throat> I remember talking with Soda about it when we were uh, putting together and divvying up the script. That at one point I was like, I'm so grateful that I'm co-directing this with someone because this was such a big project for one director to tackle would have just driven me insane you know ironically you two are probably the nicest most angst-free people <laughs> i've ever worked with <laughs> as far as, and the the fact that you guys get to do so much carnage and horrible things to these beloved characters is just great i loved it i loved it kill your darlings right <laughs> Yeah, you, you animators kind of take it to a to an extreme. I'm watching the movie, and it's like, oh, there's that character that the fans have always wanted, and oh, he's dead. <laughs> and now he's dead. No lines. Does this movie come with a trigger warning? Filmmakers, can you talk about the themes of the film? I mean, I, I'm uh, in my small perception. I'm thinking love, redemption, and consequences. 
Did you guys have anything else in mind? Were there were there tent poles you were revolving around? Well, to quote Alan Burnett, violence, lots of violence. That's, uh, that's not a theme, though, is it? So, in this movie, it might be. Yeah, it kind of <laughs> violence for violence' sake. Yeah. Oh, um, you guys, come on! It's a story of redemption. You're a writer. You have to say that. Of lost love. We just it's want to blow heads love. up. <laughs> there was definitely a feeling of like having your favorite action figures of your characters just smashing against each other and blowing up and everything. There was definitely that playing too. <laughs> Joke's on you. That's how I stage scenes. Yeah. I mean, you know, yeah, redemption, forgiveness, um, you know, just the broad stroke stuff. Uh, I don't know. You know, it's that those kind of things we think about after we've made it and we can watch it and have some perspective and we go, oh, yeah. Or I remember what I was thinking when we were doing that and then what headspace I was in. And, you know, you know, and well, our animation isn't particularly intellectual that way. We just go, you know, it's not, you know, lit 101. I think it was going off what you and Ernie were saying earlier about Superman being depowered. That was something that was a lot of fun to explore. Like the idea that, that um, when Superman doesn't have his powers and what is he? And it's like, it's like his, it's almost a, if you list all his, his physical superpowers, the one that people never talk about is just the strength of his character. You can't take that away. And that was kind of fun to explore that, to see, you know, how, how he would kind of still have that, capacity as a character but hindered by the fact that he's been depowered and everything yeah a lot of what we do is just go in with how does this character feel not so much what the the big picture of it is because sometimes a script starts out one way and we think we know what the theme is and in the making of it we find all kinds of other stuff that uh it's like, oh, wow, that, you know, we didn't know it was going to go there. And then we lean into it or something like that. So, um, but yeah, highfalutin stuff. It's, yeah, yeah, redemption, forgiveness, that stuff. It, the, it's always in there in the beginning. <laughs> yes. And yeah. hopefully at the end, too. But it's just, we don't go through it thinking, oh, remember the theme of this movie? We think, no, no. What's this no. character feeling? What, what does he need to accomplish? What does he. Or, or she, you know, why, why are they doing this, you know, emotionally? And the theme kind of built, you know, if we don't screw it up, the theme is still intact by the end and hopefully broadened and uh, deepened. All the characters are going to have their arcs, but then during the production process, perhaps it'll be a line read or it's a storyboard that someone drawn and suddenly something's discovered and they're like, no, we got to press on this part of it. And so that's what James is saying. I think is that stuff can change radically from what you start with. A lot of it we figured out during the editing process, just rearranging scenes, like cutting in on something that we weren't expecting to cut in on would totally change the scene. Um, like we had one in the middle of the act where we're like, oh, this wasn't like that in the script, but let's plus that more. Um, it was, that was something I was uh, surprised to learn so much about was just the power of editing stuff. Oh, editing is, is key. <laughs> it's, it, it makes, it makes us all look better. <laughs> And we had a really, I'll give a shout out to Chris Lazinski, who was our editor on all of these movies. Uh, he was amazing to work with. And he really is, you know, an unsung hero as far as the making of these movies. Um, what, this, this cast has always been great across the board. These four are shining examples. Um, They've always been willing to come and play, whether the role was 10 lines or 120 lines. Um, one, for the actors, what motivated you for that? I mean, what, what really brought you to the table for those kind of roles all the way through this, this arc, this, uh, this amazingly long epic here? Uh, 
look, coming on board with Justice League Dark, you know, having the opportunity to voice Constantine in a different way from the live action stuff. And uh, he's such a great character and having him interact with all these different characters in, in the world in, in a way which uh, uh, I haven't got to explore before was a real kind of draw to it. And also, you know, it's great to be able to play the character in a live action scenario and then voice him as well. You know, it's uh, I, I feel really lucky to be able to have done that. And I've really enjoyed the process of doing it and uh, working with everybody. And uh, the, the scripts have been great. And the way they've written Constantine has just been great. It just rolls off the tongue. And the cadence that all the writers have, have got with all the material that I've done with Constantine on the animation stuff has just been just been great. For me, it's uh, it's just a real privilege. I think you know, these, the first one uh, I, I did because it was exciting to be able to come in and be a part of the Justice League and the DC Universe because I was a fan as a kid. Um, but then when I saw how good the movie turned out to be, um, everyone since then has just been thrilled to be asked back to be a part of these films because they're just really good stories and they're, it's, the, the fans love them. And, you know, I count myself among the fans. So um, really, it's just fun. It, it it wouldn't be very um, Justice League of us if we were sitting around counting lines, or, you know, for our characters in each movie that we went into. You know, when Justice League calls, uh, no matter how small or big your role is, you just show up. You know what I'm saying? It's um, and uh, it's um, I, I I do have to admit it is. It is really fun when, and we're doing it virtually today. But when we all get together at a con, that's um, those are really the special feelings um, for me. So I mean, it's it's got nothing to do with how much or little work we have to do in the booth. Yeah, we're a lot funnier in person. <laughs> I'll agree. My favorite comedy uh, trio is is Jerry O'Connell, Jason O'Mara, and Chris Gorham at a con. That is, that is, that is vintage mixing. Thank you, Gary. You know, I, I'm, one of the things I'm proudest of, uh, I think, uh, about this experience is the fact that we were able to keep the continuity of playing Batman for this, um, this amount of films. You know, it's been 11 or whatever. And as, as James said, you know, we didn't have an overall deal. Well, I didn't have an overall deal to bring me to keep bringing me back as Batman. It was a one movie at a time scenario, and and uh, you know, to to keep coming back after gosh, I think it's almost eight years. You know, and sometimes I was off filming something on the other side of the world or whatever. But like everybody had to rally round and make the recording dates work. And as Jerry said, even if you know. Like I, I, when Batman was in um, the Death of Superman, which was Jerry's movie, it was, it was just a, a little scene or whatever. But um, but you show up as the character anyway because you owe it to the character, you owe it to your you know to the Justice League, and you owe it to the fans. And and so that I think that I think really made this special for me that I you know was able to kind of put my own stamp on it and stick with the character for as long as. As I did, and and now you know this series of films is coming to an end, and it's really bittersweet. I mean, I'm always excited to move on to other things, but it's going to be really hard to say goodbye to to Batman. Present company accepted. Obviously, we've had uh, quite, as I said, 172 different actors in this in this run. Um, everybody from Matt Lanter to Tony Todd, to Christian Slater. Uh, um, Rain Wilson, Rosario Dawson, Shamar Moore, Rebecca Romaine. Um, does anybody have a favorite guest uh, actor that's uh, that's popped into the series? I really liked uh, the the first Justice League Dark movie I did. Having played Constantine, I'd never interacted with Batman, and even though me and Jason weren't you know in the booth or doing it live action, it was really cool to kind of just call him Batsy and have that attitude to it. And that was one of my favorite things. And also, Jason, I've been looking for a Batman t-shirt for ages, man. So can I have that one? That very one there. You, you have to send it to me or something. I got it. I got it in Mexico. 
You gotta. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I, I love um, Tony Todd is not only an amazing actor, he's a really incredible voice actor as well. He's um, he, he's just, you know, it's it, it's it's not easy voice acting because you can't rest on your you you can't rest on your mug making faces to to convey emotion. It's really um, it's really a different muscle voice acting. And Tony Todd is. Amazing. But I, I do have to say, getting to work with my wife, Rebecca Romaine, as Lois, it was pretty fun. And I, I do have to admit, you know, we, we, and when I say we, I mean, Chris, you know, um, you know, Matt, Jason, we don't have the luxury of rehearsing at home. But with, with Lois as Superman, I, I did have that luxury. I, so we did cheat a little bit. <laughs> but did not record together. That's uh, quite the accomplishment there. Yeah, but in between fights at home, we we rehearsed quite a bit. <laughs> um, I I loved uh, Rain Wilson as Lex Luthor. I I thought that was a really interesting, really interesting casting choice. And I also, I think there was a movie where Kevin Conroy played Thomas Wayne. Yeah, that was pretty cool as well, for obvious reasons. It was Batman versus Robin. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I boarded that scene. <laughs> oh, is it? Yeah, it is. It is pretty funny. I mean, it is interesting when when we go to a con, how it's almost like a congressional hearing, James. You know, I mean, it's like sometimes I have to admit my 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 first panel you know, I think I was sitting next to you, James, and you were like stretching out before we went out. And I was like, what's the big deal? You know, we're just going to go out there and just say some nice things. And you were, I don't want to say getting ready for battle, but it is, it's an intense fan base doing this for the last few years. You know, it's really, it's like a congressional hearing. It's, it's been crazy, but man, you know, everybody, uh, everybody handles themselves really well out there. James, what do you think of the last question that Gary always allows? Oh, <laughs> well, the, the benefit of this is we don't have that last weird question from that very special uh, audience member. Last time was my fault on the Batman Hush panel. I actually <laughs> said, there was a guy going, I've got one last question. Everyone was like, no, 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 we're out of time. Gary was like, Jay, no, we're out of time. And I was like, oh, come on. He really wants to. He's been here. He's been lining up all day. Let him ask. And it was some dread. I can't even remember what the question was, but it was like. That's always trouble. That's awful. Every time. And we were just. Always fun watching the, uh, watching the mouse walk right up to the mouse trap. Yeah. And then we were just trying to get off stage after that. That was all my fault. When the guy is walking on people's heads to get to the mic, you know it's not a good. Uh, it's not going to be a good question. <laughs> So thanks at home for not asking any questions right now. Uh, what what have you guys learned about yourselves playing these characters? That I don't drink as much as John Constantine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm okay. <laughs> I'll never be as ripped as Bruce Wayne. I know. Every time these movies come out, I'm start to feel really inadequate it was actually one of the nice things about this film is for for a short period in this movie um the flash and i physically are very similar <laughs> uh, sorry to give a boring answer everybody but um it's really helped me as an actor you know voice acting is um it's interesting too playing a superhero this is the first time i've i've ever played a superhero um you're playing a number of different characters. I mean, you're playing at least two different characters. You're playing uh, an alter ego and a superhero. So it's, um, and, and I have to say also voice acting is, it really makes you think about portraying characters and, and, and emoting. It's just, it's a completely different acting muscle that I had never really flexed. And, um, and, and everyone at Warner Brothers Animation really gave us stuff to work with. Um, I gotta say, like on on that end, you know, it's always weird listening to myself. But you know, watching these uh, these movies, like I, I mean, I forget that I, f I forget about you guys. Like I forget that Jerry's being Superman, and I just really like it's just it's just Superman. I buy it. It's the same with Jason and Batman and and 
Matt, I, I, I don't know you, but like Constantine is like the character was alive and I was completely um, in it. Just you guys, you guys gave great performances. It was really well done. Well, I think it's time. Yeah, you guys did. A applause. Yeah. I should add, Jerry did play a superhero before a long time ago in Justice League Unlimited. You were he's, Captain Marvel. He's, or well, Shazam, yeah. Shazam. Because well, the, the, the internet Shazam, comments, I, the internet comments would never let you live that down if you. Don't. I, I totally understand. You're 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 absolutely right. I meant I've never portrayed a live action superhero. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Okay. Wow. Well. Yeah, Jerry's got. He's got Nightwing to his credit. He's got a couple of Captain Marvels. He's got Superman. He's uh, he keeps coming back when we oh, least suspect it. It's funny though. I've really grown in this role of um, Superman. It's really um, I've I, I've really I, I've I've grown as an actor in this role. You know, I mean, when you hear some of my earlier, um, uh, some of the early, I I. I I really believe I'm a lot better now than I was um, when I first took on Superman. It's been uh, it's been a real um, it, it, it's not only been a joy to work on. It's been a real learning experience for me. Why don't we check out another clip while we're at it? Um, this is a clip uh, we call Suicide Squad from uh, Just League Dark Apocalypse War, which, if I haven't told you already, is now available on digital, and you can grab it on Blu-ray and. 4K uh, combo packs coming up on May 19th. So, roll that clip. So me and my merry band of suicidals decided to go freelance. We've been taking our cut from Luthor's supply train since the show started. We're real Robin Hood types. Rob from the rich and sell to the poor. Give to the poor. Huh? That can't be right. Do you have somewhere private? You need to see this. My office. We'll discuss everything over my top-notch bottle of hooch. Now we're talking. This is a extremely violent, um, hardcore action adventure, but with a lot of humor. How do you um, find a way to balance and incorporate humor into such a uh, such an epic here? Well, God. You know, I can't help myself, which is why I'm probably not going to be writing any sort of animated ordinary peoples or, you know, American beauties. Um, I'm, I'm always in that, that like lethal weapon school where like, or aliens, Hudson's freak out is funny, not to the people in experiencing the situation, but to the audience member. And in the or or in the most tense situation, you know, in a movie like Lethal Weapon, you'll you'll get some laughs. So as long as it's not just from out of left field and conforms to character, I think that there's always uh, a um, a place to get in some humor, especially because the ones that I I seem to get on my plate tend to be the darker ones. So. It needs some levity, I think, and James has been okay with that about about the ones I worked on. I encourage it because you know the you can go way darker when you have a laugh, either before or after. Like you can you can do way more vile things to people if you lighten it up right after. So it's like the, you know it's just a blast. It's fun to be able to. Horrify people and then also give them a good laugh and delight them. And so it's, um, I don't know, I think they kind of go together. I mean, to do something really bleak, um, which we did. The first Flashpoint movie probably was, was pro it, did, it didn't have a, hardly any jokes in it. <laughs> but, you know, it was it was that kind of thing. It set it up. But I'm, I'm glad this one has a lot, as as dark as it gets, there's also some really human, fun moments in it. Uh, humorous moments, just good scenes and good interactions that are 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 genuinely funny. Even apart from the situation everyone's in, and then the directors also add to that with how they board something. You know, something that I thought, oh, this is just a throwaway line. Suddenly, it makes me laugh out loud when I when I see it executed. You know, 
you got when you got like help at home, you know, you got to <laughs> <laughs> make sure you get them on the call and stuff like that. <laughs> Uh, it's always fun, I think, to like James said, to play up that contrast. It's like if you got like something really dark, and then you're able to throw in uh, humor, it just makes it kind of create a contrast, so that the humor and or I mean the darkness ends up feeling much more dark. So, just almost natural putting in a little bit of humor. Are there rules of meshing uh, these characters? I mean, you got Justice League, Suicide Squad, Teen Titans. The, the Dark Gang, the Batman family, the Superman family. Is, is there any rule you need to abide by in any of those situations? I think you just respect the characters and any humor has to come from who they are as people. Who, who is the character? If the humor is coming from the audience knowing that pers- like, character like a person, it's, you're not making fun of them. Or if, you're, or if you're, the joke is kind of making fun of them, Everyone's in on the joke, meaning they know that trait about the character. So it's like, don't play it, you know, silly. Play it earnest. Play it, you know, the, the, the humor has to come from who they are as people and what their individual personalities are like. It's like when we developed that, um, that little thing Batman does uh, where he just goes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think that first happened in Justice League Dark. And then we kind of yeah. brought it back a few times. I think we just did it as a wild line initially, and it just kind of found yeah. its way in, and it worked. Uh, as as uh, you know, when we watched it with fans, it, it got a good reaction, so we we brought it back. But that only works because you know Batman is laconic. You know he's kind of cranky, yeah. and you know he would rather say nothing instead of many things. So yeah, yeah. it comes from it's the character. underplaying every situation a little bit. Yeah, exactly. It just it it's always it's always humorous. It's always fun, and that's that that's the luxury of working on multiple films in a series. You can build things like that into it, as opposed to just a one off or whatever. You know, that's 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 been a wonderful opportunity and a luxury, I think, for for all of us who have been part of this creatively, is to be able to build uh, from one film to another. You've also had the chance to do some payoffs in this, in particular one the fans have been clamoring for, Raven and Damien. Can you talk about putting a button on that one? Uh, that kind of, you know, again, that was one of those surprises I talked about where we didn't know, you know, when we brought Damien in to be, uh, Son of Batman, he was only 10 years old, so we had no thought of, of putting him, getting him together with a female <laughs> or anyone. Um, it was a father son story. I mean, his arc was a father son journey until we spun off the Teen Titans movies, and then we had Raven. And by that point, he's a little older, and uh, you know, their tension. And the thing with Damien is he's kind of been a through line through a lot of these movies, in that he was the one character who hadn't been on screen at all um, before these movies. So. You know, he kind of hops around from movie to movie, almost like Batman does. But uh, putting him with Raven, it was just, we saw their scenes together, again, after we had made the movie, because we didn't know, at least I didn't know when we were making it, that there was going to be that kind of um, tension with them. Um, But then the minute we saw it played out um, on the board, and then when when the animation was done, when the film was done, we were like, oh, we need to lean into that as much as we can. And so um, we got to with um, um, Judas Contract, and then, of course, this movie is uh, kind of the payoff for that for that art. I guess as when we started out, I wasn't a huge Damien fan. <laughs> no, you wanted to kill him. I did want to kill him. I wanted to kill him bad. Every single script. Um, and uh, and you wouldn't let me. And then when I saw the design for like uh, teenage Damien, I was like, well, now I think he's really cool. You know, now I want him to get together. the The film has three main relationships. There's there's Constantine Zatanna, and there's Superman Lois. But really, in the kind of the center of it all is this <laughs> Damien Raven thing going on, which it was a little bit surprising, uh, you know, how key it became. While I while I was writing it, I was like, well, I can't 
I can't half-ass this one and really because the Superman Lois story, I'm like, who doesn't love doing that? And and I've been a huge fan of of uh, Matt and Camilla uh, doing doing Constantine and Zatanna, and I knew those were going to work out. But the 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 Damien one um, with uh, Tessa was was phenomenal. Any Easter eggs that the fans should be looking for when they queue up their digital copy that they've already bought or the Blu-ray and 4K they're going to get on May 19th? Any characters that fly by that you're particularly proud you were able to work in? or We did slaughter a lot of characters that we didn't... Um that did not play larger roles at, at other parts. That was fun. <laughs> Deciding who was going to be spared and who was going to be completely obliterated. I like the, uh, the, the moment when John turns up and says, Oh God, it's my ex. And that <laughs> character who's his ex. Uh, when I read that, I was like, that's, that's, that's just so great. So John Constantine. <laughs> yeah. That's the, uh, that's the sequel I want to watch or the prequel, I guess. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure I want to watch it though. <laughs> I think you got to give a little shout out to uh, Liam, who played Captain Boomerang, just oh, yeah. with maybe a dozen lines. <laughs> and it's like every one. He's just like. <laughs> Liam and Etrigan, uh, Ray Chase. You gave oh, them plenty yeah. of fun to play with. Do, do you guys have a favorite scene in this film? Without giving away spoilers? M mine is that moment <laughs> when he comes and says, oh God, it's my ex. That, that was, that's my favorite moment of the movie from the, the point of view of, of playing John anyway. You know, that was my, uh, my favorite moment. Yes, I will say off of that, off of that, without giving away spoilers, the, the scene that I sweated the most, maybe, out, out of this was the second Constantine Zatanna scene. Yeah, for me, it was um, uh, the Batman Damien scene toward the end, um, which seemed to be you know, a big payoff for a lot of stuff that we've set up throughout the series. Uh, so it served as an emotional climax of this film, but also of Batman's arc throughout, uh, well, Batman and Damien's arc throughout this. Um, and, you know, what defines... Batman, or at least what sets him apart in this series, this continuity of films, is that he's a father, and you know it's it's a, a father son moment that I don't want to spoil, but I feel it's uh, it's it's really emotional and, and well earned. I liked. Um, there's a really I loved the Constantine Flash scene, um, but really my the, my favorite. Constantine scene that I really enjoyed was there was a Constantine Wonder Woman scene um, that is uh, just really pivotal in the movie that I just thought was so creative and well done and just good. I was not expecting. I didn't know how that turn was going to be made and that was really well done. For me, I think it was Superman getting to hang out with Raven. Um, it was just uh, it was a really fun pairing. Yeah. Right, right, Christina? <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh my favorites without spoilers the the last suicide squad scene um is every time i watch it it's a single shot but i just burst out into laughter and it was something we kind of put together in the editing room after hearing some really funny ad-libbing in the records and i'm amazed we actually put it together uh that's my favorite unfortunately i can't mention any of that it because it's the end it's like <laughs> when we get to the end <laughs> and right? the fireworks go off it's just like it's just like it's such a it's such a fan payoff for for so many different characters because it was just like we've been spending the whole movie building up to it so when it all comes out it's just that was my satisfaction well, wow. all right, James, you don't even have to go for favorite scene, but I'm going to give you the last word here, which would be um, reflections on a near decade of work for you. What what did this whole thing mean to you? What what, uh, what does it represent for you overall? 
Well, I'm still processing it, but um, uh, there's a sense of accomplishment because, you know, we didn't know going into this we were going to do it. And then when we were tasked with doing it, it was like, I think I, I was kind of blessed in that I didn't know how long it was going to last. <laughs> because I think if they had told me at the very beginning, oh, you're going to do this for seven years. And I would have probably freaked out. I would have been a, a monster to deal with. <laughs> but um, no, I, I, I think, you know, other, other places have been trying to do this kind of thing. And uh, it ain't easy. And so I, I think we, you know, everyone who's worked on this, I applaud them, all the, the talented actors, writers, artists. Everyone's an artist. All, everyone who contributed this and helped make it happen. Um, it's an experience I'll always treasure because it's not one I would have ever thought I would have either signed up for or, or would have survived. So... Um, <laughs> It's uh, and I I hope as we get you know there's some perspective on it that fans will find um, a deeper sense of enjoyment as they watch these again and as, and now that they're all complete and everything's finished that the the work stands on its own as a as a as a body of work that had some meaning and was um, especially to fans especially to to DC fans who haven't really gotten this many connected stories in a, in this kind of fashion. Um, I don't know. I'm still, pers I'm still, I'm still mulling it over. I'm still um, working through it all. So ask me again in five years. <laughs> I just want to, uh, I just want to take this opportunity to thank James for, uh, for guiding us all through these films. Uh, this, Ultimately, was you know it was his series, and and he was the uh, he shepherd he shepherded it all along and took us all along with him for the journey. And uh, I, for one, am really grateful and touched by what he just said. Um, uh, I also want to thank Andrea Romano, Wes Gleason, and yourself, Gary. Obviously, all the other writers and directors, but uh, um, you guys were at the core of this from the from the beginning in one way or another. Or, or at least, you know, affected me and I developed a relationship with one of, you, one of you guys. And also, I'm going to really miss, like, the panels, you know, like, we had a great time, you know, Jerry, Matt, Chris, and all the other actors, like, we had such a good time with the fans. Um, and watching the movies in front of up to 5,000 fans at a time sometimes was just such an incredible experience and, and what a privilege, you know, so... Thank you. All right. We're going to wrap this up. I want to say thank you to Matt Ryan, Jason O'Mara, Matt Peters, James Tucker, Jerry O'Connell, Chris Gorham, Christina Soda, and Ernie Altbacher. I want to say thank you to everyone that's ever worked on one of these. I want to say thank you to the fans who have supported this series and these films for so long and uh and everyone that's added to this incredible legacy and um i hate to say the words but goodbye thanks for coming thanks for watching don't forget to go get this on digital if you haven't already and one more time may 19th 4k and blu-ray go get them thanks everybody i'm gonna go cry now bye bye, bye.